Hi, um, my name is Julie Meyerowitz. I am with you from Hear My Words RDI, and I am with you today with Linda Kelly Hartman of AAC on the Lakeshore PLLC. And we're gonna be talking about, it's interesting, I, we actually did not plan questions today. I'm very excited about this. We realized that we have a lot to talk about, so we decided not to talk about it first. And you're gonna hear us meet each other basically today and, and learn what one another do because I think there's some good overlap. And I think, I think we're gonna have good questions for each other that would be fun to get everybody uh, to share our reaction to each other for the first time with our audience. So um, Linda, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Um, and then we'll continue from there. Okay, um, I'm Linda Kelly Hartman. Um, I own a practice called AAC on the Lakeshore, PLLC. Um, my business is located near Grand Rapids, Michigan, yeah. and near the Lakeshore, uh, which is where <laughs> that came from, uh, basically. I've been in private work uh, in this uh, way for about two years. I had about 30 some odd years in the schools where I worked with all disabilities. I uh, was a special ed classroom teacher, a speech pathologist, of course. Um, among other things, I did some private work many years ago focusing on kids with Down syndrome. Um, and I've always had kind of that parent perspective with all the work that I've done. So now I'm focusing on AAC, Augmentative Alternative Communication for those kids who need an alternative or augmentative way to communicate. That's amazing. I actually really wanted to study AAC and I just like, whenever I tried to take a course, there were conflicts. So I'm really excited sure. to, to hear your perspective. Um, actually, I told you a couple more questions that I'm gonna ask you before we sort of just like break loose. Yeah. But um, you use the term, you've always had a parent perspective in the work that you do. Can you, can you talk more about that, what you mean by that? Well, by that, I mean, like my first business was called The Parents Partner. I understood from a very early start in my career that nothing happened without the parents being part of the whole picture. Um, yeah, so, and the focus right now of my AAC is more or less that it takes a village philosophy. Oh. Um, my intent is to be a part of what the school system is doing with the students that I see as well, and to involve the whole family, um, anybody else who's out there and also working on getting my own uh, referral network of people. So if I have a question around something the school doesn't know the answer to, I can reach out to an occupational therapist or a psychologist or somebody like that. So that. that's what I mean by the parent perspective. And especially since COVID, um, I am finding that by using Zoom therapy mm -hmm. or teletherapy, whatever you want to call it, I'm able to reach the parents more effectively. Definitely. I'm no longer the one doing all the work and having them watch me and every once in a while try it. They are now having to do it because I'm not in the room. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that I'm now spending more time initially with the parents all by themselves, just mm -hmm. talking about, this is what we need to do. This is what I'd like to focus on today. This is how it works the best. And I'm finding good results. I really am liking it. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what I mean by the parents' perspective. Parents have had to be much more involved from, from the outset with Zoom. And you said that you've had good results. I want to hear more about those results because that, that, that's the most important part. The way that we talk to kids has to match the way that we expect them to talk back to us. And this is something I got back from Gail, or I got from Gail Porter, who did the pod work you know i mean basically the input what you're putting into the child's brain whether it's talking sign language or gestures or pictures through aac is what you're going to get out if you're talking to them and expecting to get another form out it doesn't work and i'm finally getting this across to the parents that they have to model and do the aac for the kids, talking to them, not just showing them where it is, but right, actually using right. it to talk to them. So then we're getting better results. That's and it shows happens. that it's functional. It shows the parents oh, yeah. that this is how you connect with your child. And it shows the kids, this is not about schoolwork. This is not an assignment. This is how you connect with the world. And what you're saying, it's so meaningful to me because I hear, because you know, coaching parents, particularly with autism, I mean, the parents sometimes themselves have autism, but I mean, parents of children with autism, I hear so often, my kid is so bossy. 
And then we talk, you see where this is going. Then we talk about declarative language as opposed to imperative language. Mm -hmm. And so often, I'm sure you see this all the time, that when there's a delay of some kind, there's so much more imperative language going in. And then when they start talking, we're like, well, why are they so bossy? It's like, that's how they're spoken to. Exactly. Right. They're modeling, they're giving back what you've modeled to them. Right. They can't, the, the output can't be different from what they've received. It can't be because they don't have any other thing to go on. Yeah. 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 So, um, and the way that I've looked at it, because I think you're talking about kids that are a little bit farther along than most of my kids are. Generally, They're usually generally. not very verbal at all um, or if, if very little, but basically the whole idea is that you can't expect them to use this device. You can't expect them to use sign language or whatever you're using unless you're doing it too. Right. Right. So there's, you know, but I understand your perspective too. Yeah, well, so. I, I have taken a lot of kids, a lot of kids from, from I, I always say pre-verbal. I never say non-verbal. Okay. Even if the person is in their 60s, because why, why would I limit? Why would I place that limit when I don't know? Yeah. But, um, but um, I've taken a lot of kids, because early intervention, I've taken a lot of kids from pre-verbal to verbal. Mm -hmm. but, um, but a lot of the, well, I mean, even, even without any, particular diagnosis a lot of a lot of kids for or early word is no because <laughs> setting boundaries is an important part of why we communicate um so yeah what kind, can you just tell us real quick what kind of results have you seen or what kind of different results have you seen now that you're working with the parents more online than well, previously when you were working more one-on-one -on -one with the kids yeah. But the biggest thing I think I've noticed is what you've already alluded to is that now they're having conversations. They're no longer making it be a task and right. work. You know, it's like it's, I keep saying to them, this is not about another job you got to do. This is about talking with your child. And I'm saying to the child, it's about talking with your brothers, your sisters, and everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to, with one family in the past month, add in the two older sisters and kind of get them to do, like just putting the device up in front of the child every day. Mm -hmm. And the very next day, they did so, and they stopped for just a second to say hi to their little sister, oh. and she said, I want go park. And go, so guess what they did? They went to the park. And this kid is also now saying, I want privacy, please, which is one of her buttons. How old is she? How old is she? she? She's going to be 12 in September. And has okay? she ever been able to ask for privacy before? Not before. No, it wasn't on her device. It was, she's had a device for a long time. Um, I finally was able to uh, talk to the parents about getting a more uh, robust communication software right. system. Um, one that included both core and a lot of fringe and phrases. I'm a strong believer of core vocabulary, but fringe has its place. Mm -hmm. And what she's got now has phrases, it has topics, it has core. She can create her own sentences, which we call snug, spontaneous novel utterances generated, or she can use full phrases in the interest of time. So she asks for privacy, which basically means mom, get out of here. And she <laughs> She's <talks> 12. <laughs> exactly. And she tells on her sisters to me. You know? That's a no, lot I of early agree. communication. Well, I, I hear a lot, of, a lot of parents saying, she's talking all the time. She's telling on people. <laughs> yeah. But that's what kids do. Right, exactly. I'm like, that's very functional. That's very real. It is, it is you know. So, so. Real quick, you use the terms core and fringe. What do you mean by those terms, core and fringe? Well, core vocabulary is something that has become quite popular in the past probably 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. Core vocabulary are all of the words except nouns. So you're talking about pronouns, you're talking about verbs, you're talking about descriptors, you're oh. talking about um, question words, negation, anything that is not a proper noun. Okay. And when we teach AAC, what we've found is um, when we focus mainly on core vocabulary with what we're doing, mm -hmm. because fringe vocabulary, the nouns, that's what they call fringe is noun. Mm -hmm. there's that's only 20 percent of the words that we use wow 80 percent of the words we use when we speak are core meaning wow. you can use them multiple times for multiple reasons and for multiple not just reasons but intents you know what i mean like what do you mean to say and do you mean to say it with force or whatever so 
once I figured out core vocabulary, and that's what most of these devices have on them, mm -hmm. the thing you've got to understand is 20% of the words that we use are core, the numbers of them. The numbers of fringe make up like 80%. So you've got probably, what, tens of thousands of nouns out there that you could know? Right. But you only maybe have around 800 core that you have to know. And oh. you can say, I want this, please, and point. And you right. don't need to know the name of this, right? which is what's happened for me with my kids on the spectrum, because they learn how to do this and they learn that they can get what they want without having to throw a temper tantrum or right. something because they don't know the name and they want them to request it by the name, you know, and I'm sorry, there's what's a that? lot. Of what's that? What's that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> name it, name it. So and it's so interesting, like one speech therapist to another, because how much of our education, of our colleagues, how much time is spent in speech therapy naming things? All the time. All and the like, time. Especially when there are no words yet. But you're, what you're right. saying is that it's found to be a lot less functional to focus there. And then also the other yeah. thing, you know, with what I do, which is moving more towards verbal, at least at the beginning, but I, I want to know at the end, I want to know when to refer to you or a colleague of yours. Okay. Um, because it's a question I always have. Um, like, when should I be using AAC? I'm always like, trying to do functional communication, which often leads to speaking, but not mm -hmm. always, and maybe not soon enough. Right. And so that's another question. But, um, but what I hear all the time is he's saying single words, but he's not putting words together because yes. like how many nouns could you put together? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> there are a few really cute cartoons out there. Chris Bugay, I don't know if you know that name, but he's no. got a, a site. He's part of Talking with Tech, a site um, with Rachel Nadel. But Chris Bugay has these uh, little uh, videos that he does with cartoon characters where this poor guy, this robot, has been basically shown all nouns all of his life so he can name anything in the room but he goes outside to talk with his friends and he says like chair refrigerator door um shoe uh, and and the kids look at him like yeah and, and, that's, and this, this is what we're giving guy, kids who are struggling with language to begin with yep right and so this little guy in the side's going in the bubble these words are useless and that what you hear all the time also is like kids on the spectrum they don't seem natural they don't like like and they're treated as as if they're not human because they're communicating as if they're not human because that's what they've been given <laughs> all they tend to teach is how to request you know right. and if all you do is request then that's all you can't say i don't want this I don't like this. This is not mine. That is mine. All the things that kids want. To I say. like you. Uh -huh. How many nouns are in that sentence? That's the none. beginning of a relationship. Yeah, none. Right. None. I want you to stay. I want you to leave. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Gail Van Tatenhold is kind of the queen of core vocabulary. What and was she the name again, a, Linda? Gail, Gail Van Tatenhold. She's kind of the queen of core vocabulary. And she has a video on YouTube and it's called The Power of Core. And it's about a, a adult in a group home, obvious group mm -hmm. home. And she goes to talk with him. Right. And he has taken his time to formulate quite a, a long group of words and sentences. And basically she explains to him, or he explains to her, I should say, right. Right. what had happened while she was gone. And it was quite serious. Wow. And this guy was able to go to the authorities at the place and tell on this worker what this worker had done. And there was follow through. How so empowering. He, That's amazing. You know, and he, didn't, he didn't use any nouns. He used no nouns. Well, it was probably a lot of verbs going on there. Verbs, describers, you know, right. negation, things like that. Yeah, all that stuff going on there. But yeah. What is your personal and or professional relationship to autism? And then how would you define autism when you're, you know, functionally when you're working with it? Well, personally, I have only met um, people on the spectrum. I don't have any personal like relatives or anybody mm -hmm. like that. Um, professionally, I've dealt with them as a classroom teacher mm -hmm. uh, in a small resource room type setting. Um, of course, I've worked with them in set, a couple center-based programs mm -hmm. where these kids uh, basically um, are there because they can't be 
basically um, handled out in the public schools, though right. not the public schools, but the non-center-based programs. Yeah. So um, I've had the luxury of being able to have um, the whole language approach, like I've talked about, and including the teachers. Mm -hmm. So That's for beautiful. me, autism is all about your ability to relate to each other. Right to engage with each other mm -hmm. and to have your needs and wants known in a way that you're going to get those needs and wants met. A lot of what I've seen as behavior for children, um, I can see what they're trying to say and people are dealing with the behavior instead mm -hmm. of what do you want? What are you telling me? Are you telling me this? Right. What is going on? You know, behavior is just, communicating what their words can't yet. Behavior is communication and communication is behavior. Right. They're one and the same. And this is about to lead right into what we really want to talk about, right, Linda? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just, it reminds me, my first year, it was actually a special ed teacher that really like took me under her wing. My first year as a speech therapist, there was one boy and we were working with teenagers, in Washington Heights. Not everybody was feeling safe all the time in sure. everyday life. And there was one little boy, not so, so little, he was actually bigger than me, but there was one young man who was, and he had gotten beat up by a gang at, at a cousin's birthday party mm -hmm. and like really in like punching windows in school and, um, and not wanting to participate in the speech because he was old enough to realize this was not so cool and he wanted to be cool at least if he couldn't be successful with other things. And she came up with the best phrase that I've ever heard to describe what we as speech therapists help kids with or why it, communication is important. It's, it's where we learn, w w speech therapy is where we learn or where we teach how to get what you want and how to defend yourself. Ah, yes. Isn't yeah. that what we do, right? <laughs> exactly. And kids without commun or without, who aren't, who without words or whose communication through behavior is not understood are not able to get what they want and they're not able to defend themselves. And asking for, for privacy, the ability to ask for privacy is an example of being able to defend yourself, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Do you know um, Gail Porter at all? If you heard that name, she does the pod, P-O-D-D. -D. I have a pod in my office from a job that I was at briefly. Yeah. But I was... It was that place was too chaotic for me to stay. And so okay, I didn't stay long enough. <laughs> um, they gave me a pod but, when I left, so I was happy. But um, I, I would love for you, maybe in a different discussion, to, maybe we could have a discussion focusing just on pod. Yeah. Um, but I the reason I wanted to bring up Gail is because she has a saying very similar mm -hmm. to what you're talking about. It's on my website, but it goes something like this. Yeah. Our, our long-term goal is to teach somebody to say what they want to say whenever they want to say it, to whomever they want to say it to, and however they want to say it. I, mean, I don't just want you to comply. I just don't want you to tell me what you want. I want you to tell me everything. Right. That, everything. that you want to tell me, not to like pry yes. into their lives. Because yes. right. <laughs> exactly. we're, we're not that kind of therapist. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but that leads <laughs> right into where, that what, what began the discussion, the way that we decided to have our discussion, sure. as opposed to compliance. Right. Right. Your success is your success, not your compliance to my will and what right. I want you to do. Because I've had some difficulty with it. Um, I've right. had um, my last experience with subletting an office was in an ABA therapy center yes. and yes. I saw an awful lot of very upset kids that yes. were not um, how do I put this it was only about the requesting it was right. only about compliance it was only about you've been told to do this and you can't do that until you go there yeah. they first this, then that office. yeah yeah oh yeah they'd walk into my office of course and they weren't supposed to but they walk in and they'd grab and say oh no you can't be in here and pull them out and they're kicking and screaming and I said no it's okay come on in and I'd show the kid I say knock on the door no right and I'd say hi how you doing right. so where's the greeting for the kiddos you know right. when are they teaching greetings come right. on in you can look now you can look and they would a lot of times go up and touch that word look and i'd say yeah look you can look and i said okay let's look 
this look. Okay, now we have to be done. I have to say goodbye. Bye. And they'd leave. Now that took me what? A minute? Maybe. Two <laughs> right. Yeah. And the kid went, no problems. Right. So when you're always saying that they've got to do what you're telling them to do right there and then without giving them the latitude of expressing what they're feeling, because they have feelings too, right. you know, that whole thing is just very difficult for me to not acknowledge the full spectrum. And that's maybe when I brought in the communication matrix too, because that's, a, that's an assessment that I use for every single one of my kids. That's by Charity Rowland. I don't mm -hmm. always get this goofed up. University of Oregon Health and Science Unit. That sounds right-ish. We'll link it. Yeah. So if we're wrong, the yeah. correction will be below. Right. I think everybody right. should have access to that. Yeah. Well, because it looks at not only the verbal behaviors or, you know, it looks at what you're talking about as pre-verbal. First, it looks at the behaviors of any individual once they're born and once they're kind of like the infant stage. And then they start relating. They start engaging with you, not verbally right away. Right. And that's all what, of things. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry. I was early in my career as a speech therapist. I was trained in ABA and I was like, at the time, I was like, this is brilliant. And I used it for my art tip groups and I made everything into a video game live that everybody got prizes, right? I had gold coins. I actually had gold coins and like, you know, every, all the prizes and everything and like checking boxes. What I found it was not good for was autism. Right. Because, well, you, it, it worked well with what they already do well. They're very good at patterns and then repeating variations on the pattern with reinforcement. What it didn't do was fill in developmental gaps. It was starting from your eight, you need to X, Y, Z without looking with their ABCing yet. <laughs> so, um, and if you don't X, Y, Z, it's non-compliant and then they don't say punishment, but we will withhold the reward. And um, this is the first time I've said this on video. I'm going to, because I have been finding a lot of my videos have been, it's like, I want to share this. So many people come to me, like preschool directors, parents. It's like, it's very funny because I minored in Russian in undergrad and I worked in Russia in 2000, which is 10 years after. But there was still this very, let's close the door and then let's really talk kind of feeling oh, and yeah. see that with ABA, like people will, like, Julie, <laughs> like afraid, like big brother's going to come in and raid us. Julie, what do you think of ABA? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I'm not, I'm not so sure, but you hear this like gold standard, gold standard. Well, I'll tell you, I interviewed at many, maybe most of the schools for autism here in town at, at one point, a couple of years ago, I went, I just, Part of it was research. Part of it was I was looking for a job at the time um, during my, my uh, training for RDI. And I noticed a pattern, and this isn't scientific, this is my observation, mm -hmm. but I noticed a pattern that there were certain kinds of schools that would say, Julie, you have to realize this is a school for autism. And you're going to see kids put in isolation and kids put in holds. Mm -hmm. And kids are going to get violent. Mm -hmm. And I saw kids, and then there were schools where there was no talk of that. And I noticed a pattern that the more behavioral the program, the more they're telling me, this is autism. And you have to be ready to see this stuff. And I'm thinking like, this isn't autism. This is a reaction to being controlled. Yes. This isn't them. This is the way they're being treated. And honestly, if people were if I had no way to communicate with the world around me right? Yes. and the only access I had to people was them controlling me, I hope I would get violent. I say that, I said that to individuals that helped me. I'm about to put it on YouTube, but. Well, you know, the difference is yeah. though, if you're teaching them to, con to behave and mm -hmm. not teaching them how to communicate and get their own needs, you're back, to, you're going to get behavior. You're going because, to, because you're not giving them any kind of self way to express themselves. It's right. The same right. So, thing. so, it, so what we're, what we were saying, what we're both saying is that before the words come developmentally, we're reading their behavior 
Mm -hmm. And if we are not reading what they're communicating first, yes. their mo motivation to communicate with us goes down. Exactly. And the likelihood to communicate functionally with words also goes down. Right. Right. And, a lot and that's where you get echolalia. Everybody's all excited that they have words, but it's like the words aren't saying anything. What is he really, what is this saying to you? Mm -hmm. He's not comfortable here. So he's trying to like, yeah. Oh, you're upset. spending more time interacting with the shadow than he is with you. There's a reason for that. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. You have to find that reach. You have to find that reach. Oh, Back deep off, Julie. Okay. <laughs> so Linda, so, so, we were also talking about PEC. Mm -hmm. So I had a question about PEC because that's what I'm told, you know, I've been told all these years, you got to learn PEC. Mm -hmm. So what is PEC? How do you feel about it? <laughs> and I, I know how you feel about it. So I'll jump to the next question. What do you do instead? So what um, is PEC is the first question. PEC is a picture exchange communication system. Yeah. It's based mainly on, <clears throat> excuse me, mainly on requesting. Right. It is. A picture or icon form it can be photos it could be icons for it yeah. um, and you start out with just discrimination um, you know meaning support. knowing this one from this one yep yep so but the kids basically build a down vocabulary through a very systematized way of learning right. how to do it so and it's been so long to be honest with you I don't remember the protocol I was trained in the early pecs later pecs I went through three basic long trainings and, when, and I was also um, asked to do uh, the VB MAP program, which oh, is- Yeah, VB MAP, that's also very popular. So what does that stand okay. for and what is it? Verbal yeah. behavior, milestones, assessment, placement, and planning, I think is what it is. Okay. <laughs> so our, the school district I worked for the last time had adopted it for everybody, autistic or not. Also and not, that, okay. Yeah, and that was a major, major mistake. Because um, we had kids that were cognitive impaired, um, severely, multiply, physically impaired, that were all having to do these things. But what is and it? Like what? What is it like practically? Like in in, in a minute? It, like what does it look it, like? Yeah. It's it's a training program basically for how to learn how to do math, reading, talking, following directions. What are your barriers to learning? Again, I mean, I I didn't deal with it much, so I'm not the expert in it right but what I can tell you is it was a t group of tasks that the kid had to learn like what you're talking about with ABA uh -huh. so they had to learn it in this order and the thing of it was another colleague and I looked at this at least the language perspective of it contacting and manding are their big words for that. <laughs> you remember that you know? so I had a brief training so in a brief, once, yeah. yeah we're lo looking at this sequence of things they've got going again like you said if they're this old or that old or that this stage whatever right so we're looking at Typical development, we're going, uh, no, this is not <laughs> typical development, you know? So, right. and what I've had to learn that in a lot of ways, um, the people who do ABA, PECs, things like that, there do you. not necessarily go by developmental um, language, to, you know, therapy. They don't, yeah. They, it, it's kind of the two different things to them. Right. So it's like you're this age, you should be doing this now. And if you don't, often because you can't, but if you don't, then you're being non-compliant. Exactly. Right. And a lot of that is because, well, you can't expect them to do it at that age. They aren't, they haven't done all of these precursors in their language learning. The age is irrelevant. The development is, yeah. yes. That's right. what I guess I'm saying. Developmental versus what they have, which they see as their basic prescription on how what they should be doing. Them. Yeah. Based right. on their. Yeah. 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 You know, um, yeah, it's, it's sad. I, I explained core vocabulary to the last owner of the place where I was working. Um, I just was a subletting person. And she got very excited about it. She'd never heard it. She thought it's great. And she leaves and she says, I'm going to have to look and make sure that this is evidence-based practice. And I went, well, yes, there's research out there. But the scrutiny that you guys are looking for is probably not there. Okay, okay, so the other thing I'm going to say is a lot of a lot of things that are working very well with kids and families, I'm just gonna put it out there, is not considered to be evidence-based practice, not because it doesn't work, right, but because not enough research has been done on it, because yes. there's disproportionately low funding for autism research 
based on what the incidence and prevalence is of autism in culture, meaning that there are disorders, disabilities, illnesses, needs, because there's, a, you know, there's also, is, is autism a disability is a different question, a, long, a longer conversation that, that could be had another time, but, but there are needs that there are less people with these needs, that there is more money in that research. So they're getting more, often because it's a physical issue. Right. People, people, people put priority on physical over emotional developmental for whatever reason, for a very concrete society, I suppose. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I'm letting it all out there in this interview, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which isn't even an interview. Maybe that's why, maybe I, I need to hide behind my questions from now on. So to keep everybody safe, but oh, no, we're fine. <laughs> but what's considered evidence-based the evidence base that ABA is basing themselves on is what's great about ABA, if you want to say that, is that they are doing things that are measurable and visible. Right. right. A lot of the developmental gaps are less measurable and less visible. Mm -hmm. And it's real, the other great thing about ABA in terms of research and making it easy to research is it's replicable. <laughs> Yes. And meaning that it's not individualized, that you're doing the same thing to and for everybody. And then you're getting <laughs> measurable behaviors. What they don't report on are adult outcomes. Mm. And what they don't share is whether or not <laughs> this approach met the standards that Lovas had set for it. it. ABA didn't meet Lovas's standards for validity. There's an article I'll have to look up again that somebody wrote about the the level of scrutiny that the um, the ABA people want for their evidence based practice, mm -hmm. and that there's been a few things that have been not quite um, up to that par that they've accepted. Right. But the point of the whole thing is that, um, like, kind of what you're saying, you don't have to have this very uh, statistically proven, you know, da 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 da, because it's so methodolo methodological. <laughs> methodological, very good. <laughs> got it. I think I got it with the wrong syllable. Speech therapist okay. learning to talk. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, at this point, <laughs> right? No, I'll, I all the time. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. I think what it is is what we're saying is there are there is validity to this other work. Just mm -hmm. like you said, it hasn't been around that long. There's research mm -hmm. money's not available to it. Right. But we are finding, and even like I said, the kids that I took off of doing verbal map, you know, ABA PEX kind of thing into core vocabulary. And this is a kid that was doing it with picture cards to put down, creating his own sentences. He went back in the room and said, I want this instead of throwing a fit because he couldn't find the video he wanted. He right. pointed to where he knew it was. And no problem. And then you could put no. in his device once he's asked for it three times, you know, this is an important word. Then you put yeah. that noun in his, in his device, right? Yeah. Well, you have to have nouns in the device too. You can't just have just a core. You well, can. the other thing is not everything is already always present to be pointed to. Right. There's the rub. You I know, can want my mom when I'm at school and right. that's a valid feeling, right. even though I can't point to her. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's the difference, though, between that more concrete versus that more abstract. It's not in your presence right now, you know, that kind of right. thing. So, so, yeah, definitely. But I think there's so many things that these kids want to teach us and to, uh, talk yeah. to us about and teach us about themselves right. that they just aren't being shown how to do, nor they can't do it on their own. If they could, they would. But they're mm -hmm. showing us, like you were talking about, in other ways. Are they coming up to you and maybe not looking at you, but, you know, like you said, doing this. Okay, what do you need? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Now, you I, I just spoke to an OT. I just posted her video this morning. I just spoke to an OT last week. I didn't realize this. Maybe you've heard this. That this is, um, it's not, I, I often see it as anxiety, um, a lot of the stems, but something that I, 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 I want to have an OT, like that I could call any moment of the day oh, yeah. because yeah. there's so many questions as a speech therapist that I just don't know the answers to that I have a feeling like an OT would know about this. They're just telling me, um, visually orienting themselves. Right. So much so of their sensory systems are, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. Like, there's a reason it's not bad behavior. It's right. 
trying to, you know, say it's communicating too. Yeah, yeah it's, it's communication. communication. You know, Even if the communication is discomfort so that we, yes. that we see that instead of you're being bad because you're disrupting my class. Yeah. And stop that. Put your hands They down. might be in pain. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, I what do, so, so a lot of us have heard of AAC. A lot of us have heard of PACS. A lot of us have heard, a lot of us haven't, but uh, um, VB map. These are, these are names that are out there and considered evidence-based or familiar or, yeah, I heard about that in school, so I think it's worth trying. What do you do instead? I do core vocabulary. Core vocabulary. Everything that I'm talking about is core vocabulary. And right. There's a lot of stuff going on there, uh, out there. And the thing of it is, you can teach it in a group. You can be in a whole classroom. My classes used to have core boards. You start out with usually something that is like with the first words that kids typically say, core right. words. You add in the, the fringe. Each kid has the same kind of board in front of them. But then they also have what they call their personal fringe. So like the name of their favorite toy, right. um, their mom's, you know, their brother's names, things like that. Uh, the dog. And you teach them to interact with that. You know, in a classroom lesson, you can have the words, you look, I look, I go, you go, I not go, I, I see this. You know, all those things. And I like, I want, yeah. Any you can put it into any lesson. You teach math that way, reading that way, social studies that way. Okay, you look, mm -hmm. you know, direction so, giving. Yeah, so have you tried, have you, uh, did you have periods that you were doing PECs or VB math? Yeah. Or, so can you tell us, it's just me for now, but for us generally, what, what results you saw that were different? This versus this. Um, probably the biggest thing I saw was le the reduction in behavior issues. Mm -hmm. um, with the PECs, um, a lot of the kids could only go so far. There's different levels of PECs and the number of words that you have and how you can combine them. Like, mm -hmm. I want this, I like this was pretty much the phrases that you learned with PECs. But they would get to a certain level and because they would have to be able to discriminate the number of pictures, they were in a notebook, they weren't right. in any necessary order. They would have to discriminate. Well, they weren't able to discriminate. And that's a lot about, sometimes to so like flip through all yeah. of it. Yeah. The thing about vocabulary boards is those pictures are stationary. They're always right there. So, so you if get you to want to familiarize out, yourself with where that word, where which we is. really it's, do have in our, like we have a place in our head where a word lives. Yeah. Multiple Most places. Their memory. Well, it's, and it's also motor memory. It's the same thing as when you get into your husband's car, do you have to look for where the wipers are? We I don't share a car, but I, I get, I get your okay. message. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the idea, you know, it's like yeah, you get into yeah. somebody else's car and it's like, okay, now wait a minute. I'm, my wipers are here and his are over here. You well, know, that go into Target. Motor memory. If, yeah. if you were to come into Target in Baltimore or I were to go into to Target by you, we know how to find the toothpaste. Right. Because right. like, it's the same target. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. yeah. We have, we have Menards around here, which is a home improvement place. And they're all set up the same except for one. And that's the one my husband won't go to because he can't find anything. <laughs> Why? Why did you go? <laughs> I know. But it's the motor memory. So that's the mm -hmm. thing about core boards and about devices with core boards on them. Those words don't move. So the kid always know if I want to say hi, it's in the top left-hand corner. If I want to say done, it's in the bottom right-hand corner. And you teach kind of those things first, and then you add and fill in. So then as the board grows, the I is still up there, the done is still down here. But especially, things make more especially when we're talking about people, humans, who have such little control over their world generally. Yeah. To yeah. then also have to really then go and find your words. Behaviors are easier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Behaviors are easier to express the frustration of, I've just been in seven hours of therapy today. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, and why is it wrong for them to be, not be able to say, or to, why can't they say, I not like this? Right. Because I not like this. Because maybe we don't want to hear it. But that's not yeah. okay. That's not yeah. okay. Because we can say it whenever we want. Exactly. Whether people want to hear it from us or not. 
being right. able to say whatever you want to say, whenever you want to say it to whomever you want to say it to. You know, oh, Linda, I want to hug you from halfway across the country. <laughs> it's beautiful, uh, you know, and you know, with masks and everything. <laughs> it's the virtual <laughs> like hug. Like facial field and a hug like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, when do I know that that this child or adult really should have something augmentative or alternative pictures or a device to communicate? At what point should because you know families are resistant to that like they're resistant to signs they want the words verbally right. um when when should i when when can i be confident saying you know what let's at least do this for now what wh what's the line that i should be looking for i don't know if there's really a line because aac is good for anybody okay. the thing that people think is that aac is going to stop the kids from trying to talk verbally mm -hmm. it actually encourages it mm -hmm. they tend to talk more especially if they have a device that speaks for them mm -hmm. and they are in control of touching the buttons and a voice comes out rather than us being the voice which is why i didn't really like the pecs or even sometimes right. the pot is about me doing the talking mm -hmm. um that makes the biggest difference. So I have kids that have art, severe artic issues. Right. And yeah, they can talk, but they can't make themselves understood. Right. So I would have them use that as their backup system. Mm -hmm. But any child who is behind, behind developmentally in talking, any kind of an assist is good to do right then and there. It might just start the, the ball rolling, rolling so and you can take that. that away later. But to right. start it out right away, you're only helping them. You're right. providing them with the language skills, the inner language by modeling the language and them being able to do it back to you in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, their motoric system won't let it do. Right. Right. So you're providing them with the language and the motivation because once they do it, they're getting things. And once they get things, they're like, hey, this is cool. Right. And it's they self, that's talking. the other thing. It doesn't like the, the ability to get what you want and protect yourself is motivation enough. You don't need M&Ms then. You have control over your world, which is a, like much more control over your world and recognition within your world. Yeah. That's a lot, that's worth a lot more than, than an M&M. &M. Okay. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. A thousand exactly. times more at least. So what takeaway would you like to share? What, what do you hope people will get out of this, out of our conversation, parents and other professionals? I think the biggest takeaway is it's never, too young, too late, whatever, to use a system like core vocabulary, whether it's through augmentative alternative communication, high-tech devices, low-tech. The thing of it is you want to keep engaging the child in language. And a lot of what I've seen with PECs is not language, it's vocabulary, it's single right. words. You're not being able to put together a sentence. You're not being able to do anything but request. Where's your ability to do things like say, I really like that, mom. You know, I mean, what would a mom I like say? you, mom. Exactly. I love you, mom. You know, <laughs> I've got one little guy that every time he says hi to me, it's on his page, but he says, bless you. <laughs> Thank you. you know? <laughs> he just has learned to do that. So, but yeah, you know, I mean, there's so much more than just compliance and just requesting to make you happy. And I it like with that bless you that you just said, uh, you, the other thing I think people worry about is that it, then, then the child will start to be seen as a machine. Yeah. But it, it, what you just showed with that is that you can give individualized options. Like this is maybe this yes. child has a, a religious or spiritual side to him. Yeah. That, like he wants to, and to show more than just, I see you, but like, I, I want good for you. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. That's no, so yeah. sweet. So yeah. I'm Julie Myrowitz yeah. from Hear My Words, R RDI, um, autism coaching for parents of children with autism and adults who are independent with autism. And Linda, um, where can people find you? And we'll put that also, we'll put all of this in the comment section down below. Okay, uh, Linda Kelly Hartman, AAC on the Lakeshore PLLC. Uh, the website is lake, aaclakeshore.org. Um, I'm on Facebook too with that. Um, my email is lindakhartman at aaclakeshore.org. Um, 
love to talk with all different types of professionals. Um, I'm definitely like Julie's talking here about, you know, knowing that we can't do it on our own. Right. We need the other professionals uh, to help us to learn to help us learn theirs and help them learn ours. Right. So because we want to give everything, but we are also human. <laughs> right. We exactly. To, we have to know our own limitations. Linda, it's such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much. You. And I'm Thank sure we'll you. talk again. Yep. I enjoyed it, Julie. Thank you okay. so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please click like and share with anybody you think can benefit from it. For more videos like this, please subscribe. To request a video on a topic that we haven't covered yet, um, go ahead and leave a comment down below and I'll see that. And if I get enough interest, I'll make a new video. Also, you don't have to do this alone. Um, you could join our, you could join the discussion in our private Facebook group and the link is in the comment box down below. Or if you're interested in working with me personally, Send me a PM on Facebook and we'll make a time to talk. In the meantime, use your powers and take care.